Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. It is, what is it? It is week eight. Is that correct? Yeah, that's week eight. It is spinal anatomy kind of virtual lab, and we'll do it like we did last week. I'll do it ahead of time so I can use my home studio here and get some nice overhead shots. And here we go. So atlas axis, just like the work, if you've looked at the worksheets, you know what we're going to do, atlas and axis. Um, so here's, here's axis. This is C2. And if I bring atlas in and put atlas on top of it, now we have atlas and axis. These are very important bones. Some chiropractors believe that these are the bones of all life. And this is the only thing you need to adjust. Some those straight chiropractors believe that. I don't particularly believe that. But nevertheless, that said, they're very important bones. So you need to know every nook and cranny of these bones. So let's go through, let's go through Atlas first. And let me actually take a look and see. Yep, I can still see both of these. We can put them side by side. All right, so atlas, axis, AKA C1, C2. So atlas is the top bone, the highest bone in the spine. It connects with the occipital condyles of the skull. All the rotation of your head, when you twist and turn your head to the right or left, it all occurs right here, right around this little peg. See how that works? And that little peg is called the odontoid process or the dens. And if you look at the atlas here for a second, you'll notice that there's no vertebral body, right? Where's the vertebral body? There is none. So the dens is actually the embryological vertebral body. It kind of stole it, embryologically speaking. All right, so let's go through these parts of Atlas, this weird bodiless Atlas. And uh, it's a ring of bone. It's made of four parts. We have an anterior arch here. In this specimen, it's not poked out too far or arched out too far. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see a nice tubercle right here, a bump. That's the anterior tubercle of Atlas. Uh, if we go back, you can see the posterior arch of Atlas. And then you can see this rough area is the posterior tubercle of Atlas. So we have an anterior arch and a posterior arch. And then we have these clumps of bone here. These are basically, these are articular pillars, but you don't call them that. You call them the lateral masses. So these are the lateral masses of Atlas. I don't know how this is going to work out, but if I turn it up like that, hopefully you can see the lateral masses. I'll try to hold it down like that. Well, let's see, how will I hold it? I guess I can hold it like that. There we go. So you can see this massive bone. Those are the lateral masses of Atlas. Uh, they're really just the articular pillars because here's the inferior articular process. Here's the superior articular process. I mean, technically, there would be a pars interarticularis right about here. Um, it doesn't, you don't have a pars fracture in Atlas. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you can see the anterior tubercle quite nicely right there. I'm holding it by the transverse processes. Sometimes they're really long. Sometimes they're really short. You'll palpate those next quarter, or you'll try to palpate those. Uh, they're not very long in the specimen. So what else do we have? If I tip it up like this, we can see on the anterior arch, we have a facet here, don't we? See that? Uh, that's the facet for articulation with the odontoid process, or the facet for the dens or you could say it different ways, the anterior arches, facet for the dens, just facet for the dens or facet for the odontite process uh, will be fine. I hope it's focusing in on that. All right, and while we're here, you can see a couple of bumps here and here. It looks like a double on this one, which is a little unusual. 
That's colliculus atlantis. Uh, and there's a ligament that runs right between these. And that ligament traps the dens in between here so the dens can't get out. So that's a very important ligament, that transverse ligament of atlas. We'll talk about that more in class. We can also see the kind of hollow superior articular facets here. So uh, the older you get, the more concave these get. But those are the facets for the superior articular process, right? Uh, if I turn it up like this, let me hang on for a second. Let me see if I can. I guess it, no, I guess that's not going to work. Uh, if I turn it up like this a little bit, you can see a nice hole right there. So that's a transverse, the transverse foramen of atlas. That is for V3. Part three of the vertebral artery goes through there. If we turn it down like this, the vertebral artery would come out of this hole, do a, about a 100 degree bend right here, and run right in a little groove right here. That's called the groove for the vertebral artery, which is really on the back side of the superior articular process. Groove for the vertebral artery. The articulation between the the superior articular processes and the, I don't have an occiput to put in here, but if an occiput would be landed on here, this joint has a special name. It's called the atlanto-occipital joint. So this is half of the atlanto-occipital joint right here. Right? This, of course, is the vertebral foramen, this hole. If I put atlas or axis in here as well, I mean, we're not in, we're still doing online testing, but if you were in class or if we were having an online test where you had to write stuff down, I put a pipe cleaner through like that. Um, that's the vertebral canal. The vertebral canal is made by vertebral foramen. All right, I think that's about it for Atlas. Now let's turn it upside down. How can you tell which way is up and which way is down? Uh, well, the inferior articular facets, which we can now see, are very flat, and they match the very flat superior articular facets of the dens. Let's throw the dens in here real quick. See, they're flat. So those, uh, they match each other. I'll put them both up like that. I think you can see them okay. Right. Uh, so great. And I think that's all we had to really say about Atlas. Uh, there's that tubercle again, that an anterior tubercle you can see quite nicely here. And this is the anterior arch, posterior arch. There is no lamina on the Atlas. All right. Let's, uh, let me show you one more thing. Let me bring another one in here. I found this, uh, this one. This is an old, quite an old specimen. Uh, but anyway, this is, well, you tell me, are we looking, is this a S to I view or I to S view? Well, you can see the, the concavity of these facets. So these, this must be the superior articular facets here. If I flip it over, see how flat they get? So that's the inferior surface right there. Okay, you can also see colliculus atlantis is pretty good on this one right here and right here. But the reason I brought this back in, we can see the the groove for the vertebral artery would be here against the posterior side of the superior articular process. Look at this other one, how weird it is. Look at that bone covering it, right? I got a little foramen that's created. That's all, all called the arcual foramen or the arcuate foramen. And this bony covering is called a posterior ponticle posterior ponticle. It is associated with migraine headaches. Uh, so we will talk about that more when the time comes. But I, I'll, if I put it up like this, I don't know if that'll, if it'll focus on it. Maybe if I put my, and I know my hands are dry. I had lab today, so I wash my hands like a thousand times and I don't put any, put any lotion on. So don't send me email comments about my dry skin, please. I know it's dry. Actually, for dermatology, that's called, that has a name. 
That's called xerosis, dry skin. Anyway, I'm <laughs> digressing. I have too much energy for the end of the day. I should be tired. That's the arcuate foramen or the arcuate foramen right there. What if I go on this side? There's nothing, right? There's just the groove for the vertebral artery here. Right, so that's the arcuate frame. Let's look at the dens, or let's look at the C2 vertebrae. Uh, again, this is a top view. This is the odontoid process. Uh, we have a superior articular facet here, right? Or you could say that the facet of the superior articular process or the superior articular facet would work. Uh, we have the body. So if I turn it up like this, there's the body of of axis right here. Here's a front view of the dens. Look at that beautiful facet right there. What is that attached to? Well, that attaches to the facet of uh, on the anterior arch, the facet on the facet for the dens on the anterior arch. So it attaches like that. I don't know if that's going to work out, but it would attach just like that. Right? And if I flip this one over again just to show you it again, there it is right there. All right, so now we, we're back to more of a normal uh, design. So we have lamina, nice thick lamina right here. We have a bifid spinous process that is very thick and powerful. You'll learn to palpate that next quarter. Uh, we also have stubby little transverse process or little transverse processes here and here. To see the, neuro, the transverse frame, and I have to really tip it over uh, for you to see that. And you can see it right there. It projects. We'll talk about it more in class, about how it projects. But um, this is the birth of V3. Uh, down here is V2. Once you come out of here, you get named V3 of the vertebra artery. And that'll make more sense when we go over it. If I flip, flip it upside down, uh, we have the facets of the inferior articular process here. Uh, there is the bony implant, inferior bony implant. Uh, there's the body here in that view and um, yeah pretty much short and sweet now these have special names as well um, these also connect with the atlas as we know and that setup um, so these are in the land the the word for atlas or for act for atlas is Atlant atlanto so you always name that first so these would be the atlanto axial joint, or half of the inferior half of the atlanto axial joint. Where's the other half? Here's the other half. If I flip atlas upside down, there's the other half of the atlanto axial joint right there. Got it? Okay, I think. Did I get everything? Uh, there's one more facet we should look at. See the facet right here? It's not as nice as the other ones, but that's the facet for the, tr the transverse process of atlas. So this is a really weird setup we'll talk about in class, but a ligament comes here, and there's actually a articular capsule around the ligament where it connects to this bone, uh, and it's filled with synovial fluid and the whole nine yards. It's a real diarthroidal joint here. Very strange to have a joint between a ligament and a, and a bone, but... We have it on both sides, actually, and we'll look at that. We'll look at that more in class. All right, I think I got all the parts that I need to get. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, these inferior articular pro facets of the inferior articular process, they're back to the normal plane. We're back to a normal facet joint again. Uh, but these are weird, right? They're, um, and, and if I go like this, you can see the plane uh, of it would be about 45 degrees. They're facing forward. But we're back to that similar design. But this is still weird, right? These are facing almost, I mean, facing almost superiorly, which is weird. So atlantoaxial joints here. This is probably the hardest part of the lecture. This is a kind of oblique overhead view of C5 vertebrae. And I'll go over this. I'll do it in class as well. But let's just go over the parts in general here. So uh, we'll start with the easy stuff. This, this is the bony end plate. Uh, actually, we could call it the cartilaginous implant, isn't it? Because it's got a blue-like articular cartilage on it. So the superior cartilaginous vertebral implant. Uncinate processes would be sticking up here and here. Uh, we have the anterior strut 
uh, or anterior bar of the transverse process. There should be a bigger bump right here for an anterior tubercle, posterior tubercle of the posterior bar or posterior strut. Intertubercular lamellae is underneath this. Uh, we have the transverse foramen actually transporting the vertebral artery. This would be V2, part 2 of the vertebral artery, if this is C5. And we got two vertebral veins that travel with it. And now let's back up and talk about this thing. So this is the spinal cord right here. Uh, we, have, we have white matter around the outside and gray matter on the inside. I'm not going to go crazy, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in lab. Um, this is a cord level. Um, so this would be, if this is C5, the, what disc would sit here if this was C5 bone? Well, that means C4 would be above it. So C4 disc. Um, so this is, this is C5. All of this nerve stuff is C5, and this is the C5 cord level. The C4 disc, if I drew that, would sit here, but everything else is C5 property. So this is the C5 cord level. So we have, it's better to see them right here. We have maybe what, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or so of these little, these little wires coming out of here. So those are called rootlets. And these rootlets kind of highlight the cord level. So the cord level of C of C5 is actually all of this material, this level right here. The rootlets in the front or anteriorly are called motor rootlets because they transmit the signal. If you want to scratch your nose, they, they transmit motor signals to contract muscles. The nerve rootlets back here are sensory nerve rootlets and the sensation of the itch actually came through these sensory nerves here. These are sensory rootlets. The rootlets converge into a big, a bigger root. Uh, so this is the motor root, the C5 motor root. This is the C5 sensory root. Now the sensory root has a giant bump right here, uh, and that is the ganglia, the called the dorsal root ganglia. The nerve cell bodies of the sensory root live in here. This is a very sensitive structure. If you get a bone spur coming off the superarticular process and stab that, a lot of pain, a lot of sensation down your arm, radicular pain down the arm. Okay, so the sensory and motor roots come together, and now we covered it with a, uh, an epineurium, so you can't see them anymore, but these come together into one big root here. And this is the spinal nerve. This is the C5 spinal nerve. C5 spinal nerve splits into two pieces very quickly. A dorsal ramus or posterior ramus and a ventral ramus right here. Dorsal and ventral ramus. Ventral ramus splits into two, sometimes three pieces. The first split goes to supply the facet joint. We talked about that or the Z joint or the zygapotheseal joint. We talked about that last time. Uh, this would be a lateral branch of it right here. In this drawing, we didn't draw the, uh, the superior and inferior branches of this medial branch. I'm just drawing one here on this diagram. All right, and then we have the gray ramus communicons, which sympathetic fiber runs in uh, and goes both ways in this anterior ramus here. Uh, it's connected to the sympathetic, the cervical sympathetic chain. We don't see a ganglia here, but you've seen these in gross anatomy. So that's where sympathetics mix into this. That's why this is called a mixed nerve right here. The spinal nerve is mixed because we have sensory, we have motor, and we have sympathetics all in this area here. The recurrent meningeal nerve or sinovertebral nerve has not been drawn on this diagram. All right, and then this is really important too. So we're gonna, uh, as I told the class today, if you're a surgeon and you need to, they have a tumor, spinal cord tumor, and you need to saw through or cut through all this stuff to get the spinal cord, what are these layers called? That's a great question. Which one of the following is not a layer going through the lamina? So we have lamina, we have ligamentum flavum right here, 
Then we have this epidural fat in yellow, and within the epidural fat is the posterior epidural venous plexus. This is very important. People with stenosis, when this gets pinched, central stenosis, they can't use their arms repetitively. Or if it happens down in the lumbar spine, they can't walk uh, because they can't drain the nerves. These, these veins are very important to drain the wastes that are made when your nerves are firing. All right, so lamina, uh, ligamentum flavum. Did I say that? I think I can't remember if I did. Ligamentum flavum is right there. Okay, then the epidural venous plexus and the epidural fat. Then we hit the dura mater of the thecal sac or the dural sac. Notice how the dural sac extends um, all the way to about here, to the spinal nerve. Uh, so this is called the nerve root sleeve right here, uh, but dura mater extends. The next layer is very thin. You can see it right there, though. That's arachnoid mater. Notice we have a little space between the dura and arachnoid mater. It's called the, the subdural space. It's a potential space. You've heard of a subdural hematoma that can fill with blood, though. And then once we're through the arachnoid layer, we're in the subarachnoid space. So all of this is subarachnoid space. Uh, it's also known as the, the uh, interthecal space because it's inside the thecal sac. This space out here where the epidural fat is, that's known as the epidural space. You've heard of an epidural. Well, that's where they inject the lidocaine uh, right in this area. Uh, an interthecal injection means they go right through the dura and the arachnoid bowder and inject the anesthetic here, which really will numb you up. Okay, and I think that's about it. We have an anterior and a posterior epidural space and epidural venous plexus. And I think that just about does it. I'm trying to think of anything else. I th no, I think that's it. All right. I hope you enjoyed it. Go get to work on your, your worksheets, and I'll be standing by. Email me some questions if you have any questions. See you later.